Good morning, everybody. Today is Sunday, November 15th, 2020. At least that's when I'm recording it. Not sure when you're watching it. But at this point, there are 137 days until opening day. Hopefully, we'll have some fans in the park this year. At this point in the offseason, there's not a lot going on. Teams are kind of holding their scouting meetings, kind of putting together their game plan for how they want to work their offseason. Uh, teams are evaluating their budgets. I'm sure that a lot of teams lost a lot of money this year, and so they won't be spending. That may end up helping the Yankees, even though they lost more money than anybody. They had more money than anybody to begin with. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the things the Yankees will be doing this season. And by the way, we are approaching 5,000 subscribers. So if this is your first time here or if you've been here a few times and haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Uh, I've heard a few people say that the Yankees this offseason should focus on trading John Carlos Stanton. And I wanted to kind of take a minute to talk about why that can't happen. Because it seems like every video that I post... One of the first comments or one of the most repeated comments is find a way to trade John Carlos Stanton. Well, there's a few reasons why that won't happen. One, John Carlos Stanton is only a DH at this point. So that limits the amount of teams that you can trade him to. You can pretty much only trade him within the American League. And the Yankees aren't going to trade him to another contender, first of all. And second of all, he's got a no trade clause, so he can control where he wants to go. And when he was coming over from the Marlins, he basically said he wanted to go to the Dodgers or to the Yankees. Yankees stepped in and took a chance on him that he could play left field. That was a chance that has not worked out so far. He actually played pretty well in left field his first year with the Yankees, and he also had a really good offensive season. He had 38 home runs. He really carried the team that year when... Uh, Aaron Judge was down with an injury, drove in 100 runs, 852 OPS, finished 19th in the MVP voting. I know that's not extremely high, but he had won it the previous year, so uh, he, he kind of took a step backwards. Uh, in 2019, of course, he was riddled with injuries. He hits just 288 with three home runs and 13 RBIs in 59 at-bats. I shouldn't say just 288. I mean, that's a pretty good average, but only 59 at bats so not much work for John Carlos Stanton in 2019 he comes back for the postseason he gets hurt again and then in 2020 he gets hurt after one preseason game he loses a bunch of weight over the uh, COVID lockdown time and then he comes back and gets off to a hot start against the Nationals uh, and then he gets hurt again against the Rays, ends up missing several weeks, ends up at 250 with four home runs and 11 RBIs in 94 plate appearances. But then he went absolutely bonkers in the postseason. He hit six home runs and drove in 13 runs in just seven postseason games. Now, if the Yankees had beaten the Rays, then everybody would be thinking of John Carlos Stanton as one of the main reasons why. But because you lose, nobody remembers how you did, right? So if John Carlo had gotten a chance to play in an ALCS against the Astros, he might have, you know, hit eight, nine home runs total in the postseason. That's approaching an all-time record. He would have had a historic postseason. Uh, now, obviously, that didn't happen. So nobody's going to really remember it, and people are going to just continue to crap on John Carlos Stanton. And look, I gave John Carlos Stanton a lot of grief this year because I feel like if you make 20-something million dollars, $30 million a year, you should be able to take the field. It does nothing for you to look as if you're carved out of granite if you're actually made out of balsa wood. So if I'm John Carlos Stanton, I'm realizing that obviously my swing is still there. My talent is still there because I dominated in the playoffs. What do I need to do to earn the respect of these fans, to earn my salary, to raise my standing in the game once again. When he was with the Marlins, he was one of the most highly thought of players in the game, and rightfully so. He finished with 59 home runs in that 2017 year, led the major leagues. You know, he almost became, what, the third or fourth player ever to hit 60 home runs in a season? Uh, so if I'm John Carlo, the thing I'm focusing on this winter is dropping a bit more weight, maybe not spending as much time in the weight room. Spending more time doing baseball activities. If you train your body to be a power lifter, it's tough to also be a sprinter. In baseball, you might hit a double in the first inning that requires you to sprint, you know, for 180 feet. 
But then you might have five innings where nothing happens. You might have three days where nothing happens, where you don't have to sprint anything out, where you're striking out or flying out and there's nothing hit to you in the field. And then you might have to sprint again. And that can be tough on your muscles if they're not trained for that. So if I'm John Carlo, here's what I'm doing this winter. I'm taking reps in the cage. I'm doing sprints. And then I'm sitting for a while. And then I'm getting right back up and I'm sprinting again or doing some kind of explosive movement because that seems to be what's getting John Carlo. He's a bit too muscle bound at this point. And I mean, there's a reason that most players don't look like him. It's hard to, to, to become that much of a bodybuilder and also remain, you know, an athletic baseball player just because baseball is such a different type of game. Now, John Carlo would be a great, linemen or something in football you know he could probably box guys out in, in basketball but in baseball there's such a long period between the times in which you need to sprint that your body needs to be able to make basically explosive movements from being kind of cold right so if i'm john carlo that's what i'm focusing on this winter you know his swing is still there you know that he's still got the power obviously but it won't hurt him, you know, to, to drop a little bit of muscle and maybe gain a little bit more flexibility. But either way, Yankees are not trading him. Masahiro Tanaka is still a free agent. Uh, there's been some talk that the Mets are interested in him. The Yankees are also interested. The Yankees don't appear to be linked to any big-time starters. And I'll talk about Trevor Bauer in just a minute because he's the guy that I would go after. But they've been linked a little bit to Charlie Morton, uh, to Garrett Richards, both of those guys are, you know, decent pitchers at times, but uh, they're not the guys I would go with. Masahiro Tanaka remains a possibility. He made over $20 million last year. I think he made $22 million. Uh, so he's not going to cost you that much to come back because he's in his 30s now. You might be able to get him for 16 or $17 million, more likely 18 or 19 just based on, you know, not wanting to give the guy a huge pay cut. Uh, but it would not surprise me if the Yankees brought back Masahiro Tanaka on a two- or three-year contract. And again, the Mets have that new owner. He wants to spend. Tanaka's a guy who has pitched in New York. He brings in revenue from overseas with all the Japanese fans. And even though he's got a history of injuries uh, from several years ago, he's really not had that many arm troubles over the past few years. So he's pretty consistent. So, you know, he wouldn't be a bad investment for any team. Uh, and it would not disappoint me if the Yankees brought back Tanaka. I do love watching Tanaka pitch. And even though he's not the guy in the postseason this year, he wasn't the guy, uh, he does have that track record of pitching pretty well in the postseason. Now, the problem with Tanaka is that his elbow is a ticking time bomb. He tore that ulnar collateral ligament during his rookie season. He never had the Tommy John surgery. No doctors recommended that he have the surgery. They all recommended rehab. But eventually, if you weaken that ligament, eventually it's going to snap. Uh, so it always worries me handing out a contract to a, a guy with elbow problems. But, I mean, anybody could have that, that issue. You could sign Trevor Bauer and he could have elbow issues. Uh, Trevor Bauer just won the Cy Young. And, you know, I, I got into a little bit of a debate with somebody in the comments yesterday whether or not he's actually a good pitcher. I think he's a tremendous pitcher. Two out of the last three years, he's had an ERA of 2.21 or lower. And he won the Cy Young. You don't win the Cy Young Award in the National League if you're not a good pitcher. Uh, now, he will be expensive. He's going to cost you north of $30 million. And I just feel like the Yankees don't feel as if he's a culture fit. You know, the Yankees are a very buttoned-up professional type of team. And he's a guy who likes to vlog and do YouTube videos from inside the clubhouse. He's very outspoken on social media. Uh, he's had some controversial comments at times. You know, he threw that ball over the center field fence and kind of showed up his manager, Terry Francona, when he was with Cleveland. That didn't go over well. Uh, he struts off the mound. So there's a lot of reasons that I think the Yankees wouldn't like him to fit, but I like all that stuff. I think all that stuff as a fan is exciting. The game is changing. You got to have a bit more personality out there. But beyond that, he's a true, you know, 1A or 1B type pitcher. You know, right behind Garrett Cole. He's not going to be the number one. Garrett Cole is going to be the number one. 
He's younger, he's better, even though he didn't have the same kind of season that, that Bauer had. Uh, but if you have a rotation of Garrett Cole, Trevor Bauer, and Luis Severino going into the postseason, it really doesn't even matter who your number four starter is because, uh, you know, you could go with Montgomery or, or Davey Garcia. Either one of those guys is likely to give you a good outing. They're both pretty good pitchers. Uh, Clark Schmidt, you know, could end up being a, 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 you know, top of the rotation type pitcher. So the Yankees would be in good shape with those first three games. You know, guys who throw gas, who move the ball, who have command. That's a really, really tough three pitchers to go through. Uh, but I don't think the Yankees are going to do it. I think they're going to just try and hope that Luis Severino can be the pitcher that, you know, he was before he got hurt, which is really two years ago now. He was pretty good when he came back in uh, 2019 late in the season, but he wasn't the same guy. Uh, and then last year, obviously, the Tommy John surgery set him out for the entire season, and then he's going to miss probably the first three or four months of 2021. Uh, but there's a question, you know, what will he be like when he comes back? Not every pitcher comes back the same. Most do these days, but not everybody. Uh, some guys even say that they throw a bit harder. Uh, Jordan Montgomery, for instance, came back throwing 94, 95. Before he got injured, he was like 91, 92. Now, if Severino gains three or four miles an hour on his fastball, he's throwing 102, 103 at times. So, you know, fingers crossed there. But I just, I just don't see that happening. I think he's th still going to throw upper 90s, and he's still very young. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to expect to see 102, 103 miles an hour from Severino. So the Yankees are just going to kind of probably hope that. He comes back, and he's very strong. That gives you a strong number two behind Garrett Cole without having to spend all that money. I think Severino's due to make $10 million next year, uh, and uh, he probably won't get a humongous contract just because he's had those elbow problems. He doesn't have the track record at this point. So if you do re-sign him, which I'm sure the Yankees will, you won't have to spend $20-plus million. Or you might have to spend 20 You won't have to spend $30 million. Uh, But I still like the idea of Trevor Bauer. You know, prove me wrong. One big name player that I feel like the Yankees may actually have a chance on is Francisco Lindor. We've heard a couple of sports writers say that Francisco Lindor is at the top of the Yankees list. I think that's because a big priority for them is to shore up the shortstop defense. Now, we've talked about this in other videos. Um, if you do that, if you get Lindor, and who knows what you'll have to trade to get to him. I'll talk about trade chips in just a minute. But um, if you do get Lindor, to play shortstop and you don't trade labor torres as part of that deal then labor shifts over to second base that gives you a pretty good keystone combination up there of lindor and labor now where does that leave dj lemayhew i did a video of whether or not the yankees would be able to sign both i, I think they technically could if they don't spend big on pitching uh you could sign lindor or, i mean sorry you could sign dj lemayhew give him his 22 23 million dollars uh, Lindor is going to make about 21, 22 next year. So right there, that's 43, 44, 45 million dollars. Um, and you could shift DJ LeMahieu over to first base. Now that opens up Luke Voigt, the American League's home run leader, 22 home runs this year, more than twice as many as anybody on the roster. That opens him up as a potential trade piece. And the Indians don't have much power, and if they're trading their best power hitter in Lindor then maybe they get a piece back. And maybe you can sell that to your fans in Cleveland as, hey, we're not totally giving up. We acquired the American League or Major League home run leader. And he's pretty cheap at this point. Luke Voigt does not have a big contract. So I feel like that's the route to best shore up your defense. You know, an infield of uh, LeMahieu at first, Torres at second, or even you could flip-flop those guys, but I don't know what, what Torres can do at first base. He's never played first that I that I know of. Um, so you go with LeMahieu at first, Torres at second, Lindor at short, Urshela at third. And Urshela and Lindor are best friends from their days in Cleveland. So that adds to the chemistry right there. You'll probably get more out of both of those guys when they're, they're friends and they're competing with each other. If you remember, Robinson Cano and Melky Cabrera were best friends on that 2009 team. They both had good years because they were, you know, pushing each other. It's good to have chemistry, guys who are really close friends. Roger Clemens and Andy Pettit were best friends. We saw what they did with uh, New York and then with Houston. 
I'm sure there's best friends on every team, but when your best friends are also really good players, uh, it can really help out the team because they're driving each other to do better. Uh, I don't know what the Yankees would have to give up to get Lindor. You know, Voight is a possibility, but maybe the Indians would ask for somebody better. You know, maybe they would ask for a Davey Garcia or a Clark Schmidt. Davey Garcia is one guy that I don't think I would trade because uh, of the way that he performed this year. Uh, I thought he did much better than expected. And uh, the other guy I wouldn't trade uh, is Glaber Torres. Those are the two guys from the Major League roster that I think would be asked for by the Indians that you just say no. Uh, you would consider a Clint Frazier. You would consider a, uh, a Luke Voigt. If you do trade Clint Frazier, that opens you up to use a left-handed hitter in left field, maybe somebody like a Brantley, not, not that the Yankees would want to pay even more uh, money. You know, I'd imagine they're trying to get under the luxury tax, but maybe you could, you know, acquire somebody to play left field. You know, they also have Florial, who's a left-handed hitter. Maybe you give him a shot out there. He's a good defender. Uh, he didn't impress me that much. He hasn't really had much minor league experience above double A. So it's just an open question of how the Yankees want to construct this thing. But if you do get Lindor, that solves the shortstop defense problem. It also gives you a second switch hitter in addition to Aaron Hicks. Sorry, that's the uh, weekly screen report is going off. So that sound is what you heard. Um, but I feel like the Yankees could just go ahead and give them a Luke Voigt, give them a Clint Frazier. They're getting two major league caliber players back who are controlled for several years who are cheap and that allows them to still be a pretty good contender uh, in the American League Central and then the Yankees would have a young switch hitting shortstop have a chance to re-sign him for many years he's a superstar he's electric out there uh, so you know that's the way I would go uh, but tell me how you feel one guy who's probably their top trade chip is a guy who they absolutely won't move under any circumstances and if they do they're psychotic and that's jason dominguez the martian uh he obviously lost an entire year of minor league games this year because there weren't any minor league games i don't know at what level he was going to be playing anyway probably you know the a or a plus level um single a uh but instead the yankees have sent him to a venezuelan league so he's at home but they're also uh, giving him individualized coaching. They have coaches working with him on certain aspects of his game. Trainers bulking him up, trying to get him ready. Uh, I hope he doesn't become too bulky because you don't want him to have the same kind of problems that John Carlo has had. But, you know, uh, Dominguez is a different type of body type. I think he's only about 5'10". So he's, you know, if you, if you strengthen him up and thicken him up, he could really be a Mike Trout or a Bo Jackson type of body uh, where he's just, you know, extremely condensed and strong uh, and athletic. I wish that I was still living in the Hudson Valley because the Yankees have just made the Hudson Valley minor league team one of their affiliates. So Jason Dominguez will probably get a chance to come through the Hudson Valley at some point and play in the minor leagues uh, in front of Yankees fans. You know, the, the Hudson Valley team, I'm not sure who they were representing over the past few years, but when I lived up there, I believe it was the Tampa Bay Rays. Might have been the Texas Rangers. Uh, but, yeah, it was the Tampa Bay Rays because Josh Hamilton, uh, who played in North Carolina uh, at the same time as me, uh, he ended up playing in Hudson Valley. So the the Yankees wouldn't have gotten a chance to showcase their, you know, future stars on a regular basis in front of New York fans. But now that they are affiliated with the Hudson Valley, you might get a chance to watch Jason Dominguez for an entire season before he even gets to the big leagues. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does against actual competition. So far, what we've seen against him has been all, you know, batting practice clips, you know, clips against other guys in this Venezuelan league. And also one of the things they do down there in these Venezuelan baseball academies that the Yankees sponsor is they teach these guys how to live in America, basically. A lot of these guys grow up dirt poor, and then all of a sudden they have this huge signing bonus, and it's tempting for them to want to go out and buy six Ferraris, you know? But really what, what the Yankees teach these guys is about taxes and about, you know, how to pick a place to live and, you know, how to treat people, how, you know, uh, American culture 
um, you know, what, what American culture expects of its athletes, you know, how to live a responsible lifestyle. That's something that I read in the Inside the Empire book by Bob Clappish, which is a great read, by the way, so I recommend you check it out. But, you know, I think it's a really good move of the Yankees to focus not so much, or not, not it's not that they're not focusing on developing these guys athletically, but focus just as much on developing the human side of these guys. So that when they come up, they're like Glaber Torres. They're responsible. They're um, good members of society. They function well in New York. New York is a tough play, place to play, especially for a young player. Look what happened when the Mets brought up Gooden and Strawberry in the mid '80s. Both of those guys ended up having severe drug problems because you know they just you know got exposed to the bad elements of the city and they were very impressionable. When you're growing up, your brain doesn't finish fully developing until you're in your mid 20s. So it's easy for, you know, people who are in their 19, 20, 21 year old uh, phase of life to get caught up in all of the mystique of New York and to get into, you know, some problems, uh, you know, without really thinking things through that well. Uh, so it's a really good idea to get these guys educated on the city, on the major league lifestyle on you know what it's like to be a New Yorker by putting the affiliate in the Hudson Valley you give the fans a chance to get to know these players ahead of time you give the players a chance to get to New York kind of on a uh, suburban level where it's you know an hour and a half maybe from New York City so you know you're getting some of that city element it's within driving range you can go check out a game a Yankees game uh, on your off day or whatever, or the Yankees can bust down some of the minor leaguers to, you know, check out the facilities and take batting practice on the field. You know, these are just uh, things that the Yankees are considering, but uh, the Martian is somebody that I cannot wait to watch in 2021. Might have to go catch a game at the old ballpark in Hudson Valley. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and smash the like and subscribe buttons. It helps YouTube suggest this video to other Yankees fans. Tune in all season long for series previews, post-game live streams, news, rumors, ranked lists, highlights, and long-form podcast episodes. See you next time.